So without any further ado, what I would like to do is, uh, is uh, introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. Any of you who work or are, have any interest in the field of lameness, I'm sure I don't need to introduce Nigel to you. But our keynote speaker is Professor Nigel Cook from the, veterinary, the School of Veterinary Medicine at the, the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Nigel, thank you very much. Thanks very much, John, and good morning to everybody. Thank you for the survivors of last night, and I'm delighted for you all to join me this morning as I kick off this lameness uh, session. I'm really honored to, to be here at the Beatrix meeting, 3,200 attendees, the biggest on record. Uh, what a great meeting. So it's our chance to, to talk about lame cows, which we should spend a lot of time talking about lame cows. I've, uh, last 10 years, I've started my talks with this picture of this cow, and it reminds me every time <clears throat> that lameness impacts everything that cow does in her day. It impacts the welfare of the animals on our farm and leads to early removal if we don't do something about it. And unfortunately, as we look at the worldwide literature on lameness prevalence, uh, if we go from country to country and production system to production system, uh, we're still not doing a very good job of conquering this problem. If we define lameness as an animal walking with a noticeable limp, we're still at 25%. One in four cows are walking with a painful lesion in their foot every day as we go from New Zealand all the way through to, to the USA and many other countries in between. Uh, it's clear as we, as we look at the data that as we transition from this pastoral grazing system uh, to a more uh, freestall, cubicle house confinement system that we develop, an increased challenge, an increased risk for lameness. And it's perhaps uh, notable to ask the question, uh, is this an inevitable consequence of what we're doing, of uh, the intensification uh, of the dairy systems around the world, or, or is it something we can learn to, to manage? And I think it's worth getting back to basics. Lameness uh, in dairy cattle is caused by lesions, predominantly hoof lesions. And if you look at the surveys from around the world, uh, these are data from the US from predominantly larger herds out west, the same three lesions largely rise to the top of the list. Digital dermatitis, sole ulcers, and white line disease. Yes, we'll go to the bigger freestall barns and we'll see more thin soles and toe ulcers from time to time. We've got a grazing herds where white lines are the predominant problem, but we might find a few more uh, axial fissures down here. But again, throughout the systems, three lesions predominate. And so when we're trying to tackle this glo global lameness problem, it's probably worth reminding ourselves pretty regularly that all we need to do is prevent three lesions, digital dermatitis, sold ulcers, and white lines. And if we provide good control of those three, we'll probably take care of all the others in a reasonable manner across all management systems. And the other thing I want to leave you with is that lesions impact a lifetime. Once we create that hoof lesion, it impacts that cow for the rest of her life. These are data from uh, Arturo Gomez's PhD study where he basically lived in a heifer rearing barn for a couple of years. <laughs> And uh, we're looking here at the, the incidence of digital dermatitis in the first lactation dependent on the experience of the heifer during the rearing period. You can see the incidence very low in those heifers that didn't experience a lesion during the rearing period and extremely high, amazingly high, in, in those that did suffer more than one lesion during the rearing period. So if we infect that heifer early on in her life, we set her up for failure throughout her career. These problems are not going to be dealt with if we focus all of our management during lactation. The problem has already started. Economu and uh, Bicalio, a data set from a large herd in upstate New York. We're looking at the incidence of the three main lesions across the second, the third, and the fourth or more lactations dependent on their prior experience, dependent on whether or not these animals had a lesion or did not have the same lesion in the prior lactation. And as you look at that data, for all those lesions, you realize that when those animals suffer a problem in 
the current lactation, they have two to four times the risk of developing the same lesion in the next lactation. And we saw this, see this accumulation of problems through the life of the cow. And it's no surprise to me that in our cull cow population, we can end up with 10 to 15% of our cull cows severely lame, affected by these incredibly uh, recalcitrant lesions, these very difficult uh, lesions to deal with, sole ulcers and white lines in particular. <coughs> Excuse me. Too many Guinnesses last night. <laughs> so, big picture, our solutions must include all stages of the cow's life cycle and be oriented to the most common lesions. A look at the literature around the world on risk factors for lameness. There's been a, a remarkable amount of work done over the last 10 years. Factors reducing lameness risk include less standing time on concrete, provision of deep, bedded, comfortable stalls, removal of obstructions around the cow in her resting position, greater resting space, manure systems that don't revolve around automatic scrapers or slatted floors, access to pasture or an outside exercise lot seems to be a growing amount of evidence of that important role of uh, that soft texture on the foot. Use of a divided feed barrier and wider feed alleys. And of course, a number of studies have the problem of being uh, purely observational. So sometimes the use of a foot bath and a trim chute can be a bad thing. Uh, I rather think not when we use them correctly, that the early recognition of lameness uh, and the use of a correct foot bath and the prompt treatment of lame cows is a beneficial thing um, in most of the herds that we deal with. So when I look at all that, that weight of work, the, the numbers of repeat findings, I think we know a lot about how to prevent lameness. So why are we living in a world where 25% of our cows are walking with a limp? Perhaps we need to learn how to implement these findings and motivate our farmers uh, to get the job done. And that's really what we've, we've focused on doing these last 10 years or so, uh, trying to create a, a plan to approach a lameness problem, a plan that's doable, that uh, perhaps is an oversimplification, but when we're working with farmers, we need to keep our messages clear uh, and uh, be able to implement those changes. So it always starts with an assessment of locomotion uh, or mobility scoring, as you say over here in, the, in, the, uh, in Europe, locomotion scoring for us. Uh, and we go then on to an assessment of the trimming program. That gives us an opportunity uh, to uh, look at the technique uh, and the capacity. Are we trimming enough cows? But it also allows us to look at the lesions and check the records, uh, look for the pr most predominant uh, uh, lesion categories, look at uh, trends between parity groups, seasonality, and timing. And then we move on uh, to those three main uh, lesions, the, the white lines, the sole ulcers, and the digital dermatitis. And that's where I want to spend uh, the most of my time this morning the rest of my time talking about the things that we can do uh, to implement on farm. Feeding and nutrition is always important. Uh, I've, I've somewhat de-emphasized it over uh, the last few years because we're always wanting to feed the, uh, the appropriate amount of trace minerals and vitamins to uh, promote production. Uh, it's a good thing to avoid subacute ruminal acidosis and the new findings uh, regarding uh, body condition and the, the fat pad, I think are important to us in our understanding of lameness. But most farms don't manage their dairies uh, to, uh, uh, to, to create these problems. And I think we need to uh, have an assessment of nutrition for sure. But I'm going to focus on these three uh, lesion categories beyond nutrition uh, for, the, uh, for the sake of time this morning. Hoof trimming is supposed to prevent lameness. So when you go on a farm and you find feet that look like this, it's a shock to us. It's a shock that in most countries, hoof trimming is an unregulated program. You and I can buy a shoot tomorrow and go trimming. Some of you will be good at it. Others won't. It took me two years to get rid of the guy who was doing this to these cows. Removing too much sole, shortening the toe, removing the outer wall putting grinders up in between the toes, creating problems. Restoring a more upright claw angle and balancing the weight between the inner and the outer claw has been 
taught to us by Tusan Ravan and others for years. And uh, it's a good thing. If we do it right, it's a good thing. The benefits last four to six months or so. So it really promotes trimming at least twice in a lactation. And if you've got a good trim and you do it right, you can trim heifers prior to calving with good benefits. But if it looks like this, we promote trimming, we'll promote lameness. And I ask lameness experts around the world, I said, what proportion of the, the farms that you're troubleshooting on, so, so specifically lameness problem farms, is the hoof trimmer at least part of the problem? It's 100%. 100% of lameness problem farms have a hoof trimming problem. Hoof trimming is supposed to prevent lameness. So if it looks like this, stop doing it. Find somebody else better capable of providing those services. Removing the wall, uh, uh, exposing the corium in a weight-bearing area. It's a very damaging, very high-risk thing to do to promote problems, not solve them. So moving beyond our assessment of trimming, hopefully we've got a good trimmer. Uh, we're trimming at the capacity we need to trim cows as frequently as we need to in the system that we're working in. How about preventing those white lines? Floors cause trauma, increase the risk of slipping, and create wear. And they do those things more when we don't handle our cattle particularly well. And it's those two things that collide together that create the risk for white line disease in our systems. So here's a, a group of cows on a 2,000 cow dairy. Most common lesion is the white line disease, the white line abscess. You'll have all seen it. Now I'm going to tell you that these are front feet. Huh? Most common lesion on this farm is white line disease of the front feet. So we're, we're, we're traveling together to, to uh, Carl Berge and I are visiting this farm and we're, we're talking about how to troubleshoot this problem. And we're reminded of the work that Neil Chesterton's done in New Zealand grazing herds. And so I spend uh, 10 or 15 minutes just watching the cows in the holding area. We've added cows. We're asking milkers to move more quickly, push those cows through the parlor and they're pulling on the chain that operates the crowd gate. I'm going to ask you to watch the front right foot of this big black cow here as this crowd gate comes along and squishes her at the back of that group right now. So the floor is not very good. It's kind of eroded over time. We could certainly spend thousands of dollars putting rubberized surfaces in there. Don't know how we would re-concrete it when the, the place is being used for 22 hours a day. We could put rubber on there. They did that. It fails after time. It lifts up. We put a $100 timer on the crowd gate. Lesion gone in the next day. Didn't see it again. So white lines are a function of poor flooring and poor handling. Pushing cows, pushing them to slip and turn and twist. And we see a lot of poor handling on our farms. Our folks are not brought up on farms. They don't necessarily know how to deal and move with cattle. And they make mistakes. And we need to show them how to handle these cattle in a low stress manner, allow them to pick their way and reduce the risk for these, these external forces and these problems that we see. We're gonna to try to make better floors. And uh, again, universally, we haven't done a very good job of that either. Concrete is a slippery surface. It has a low coefficient of friction. So it isn't an ideal surface for a dairy cow built for pasture. So we have to put some kind of treatment on that surface to improve grip. Cobblestoning and these V-shaped grooves that are too far apart have not really improved things very much in our experience. Slatted floors, I know many of you have in European unit, units to uh, help with the management of manure. But honestly, they always increase the risk for white lines, particularly when we have these handling issues. And cows don't like them. If you watch them walk, notice where these cows are walking on the, in between the slats, just trying to avoid putting their claws on those, those jagged open holes. I'm very much in favor of the use of rubber flooring in a strategic manner. 
particularly in larger units in these transfer lanes where we help reduce wear around the parlor and holding areas. Good places to provide a softer surface. I'm not promoting using rubber in pens very much. And that's, uh, that's one of the, the issues that we see with uh, cows standing and lying on the rubber rather than using the stalls. We can, we can solve one problem and create another. But I am promoting doing a much better job of finishing concrete. And that, with agricultural contractors, uh, is a real challenge for us. The, the quality of concrete varies dramatically around the world. We've ended up with a larger groove, a deeper groove, closer together, just to provide traction and support wherever that cow puts her foot on that floor. She's always up against a groove, a space, which pushes the manure uh, out from underneath her sole, and the edge of that groove gives her that traction and stops that slip. We've got this pattern in the hundreds of farms now, and it seems to work reasonably well. Somebody should do some research on it sometime. Those North American boys, uh, confinement housed dairies. But the data shows that if we let cows outside, we can reduce the risk for lameness. A growing amount of information on, in my world, not grazing, not providing a nutrition through this access, but getting the cows out of the barn in a strategic manner when the weather is appropriate, allowing them to use that space, planned pasture access. And we've got a growing number of farms utilizing that, not just in the dry period, but also with their lactating cows. Sole ulcers and sole hemorrhage. This is the, the precursor here, and then we've got the full-blown, full-thickness defect. Not an abscess, but an ulcer. A lesion that forms from the inside out. Remember, white lines were outside in, external forces. Ulcers are inside out. They form from within. One slide to cover two decades of research on sole ulcers. Where are we? The lesion is caused by pressure and movement of the pedal bone within the claw capsule, compressing the corium and starving that corium of nutrients, and so we create a full thickness defect of the horn below it. We know that. We don't really know with 100% confidence, why that pedal bone moves. We used to think that it was acidosis and we could create this fancy pathway here with histamine and lamella hypoxia, just borrowed that information from the horse. Virtually no evidence for that. Virtually no evidence in the cow for that pathway. Still a possibility, but, but less so compared to some of these other things. Perhaps hormonal changes at calving time, working through... Uh, the upregulation of gelatinoproteases in the corium, remodeling that tissue, making it more elastic, loosening that connectivity. Some data on that in the cow. And then most recently, loss of body condition, working through that loss and restructuring of the digital fat pad below the pedal bone. So not the suspension of it, but the support uh, of that bony structure, leading to thin fat pads and displacement of the pedal bone. So that's where we stand. As we look at specimens, you look at this really nice, um, hef, probably a younger animal, cadaver specimen here, showing the uh, nice connections between the pedal bone and the claw capsule, that nice, thick, healthy fat pad below it. Uh, a lot of good supporting structures providing that cushion and support uh, in the, the healthy foot. But when we transition to the diseased claw, we notice... There's a lot of changes going on. We've lost that claw angle. Uh, we've got heel erosion here. We've already got hemorrhage in the sole locked in here. The fat pad is dissipating. The pedal bone is stretched. These connections are not as tight as they were before. And here we have this full thickness defect, this sole ulcer, all the way through uh, the thickness of the sole beneath the pedal bone, caused by pressure. Is it any wonder that these animals are susceptible to this lesion repeatedly as they uh, increase in age, as they go through the production cycle? You can't repair the damage done. So we know from the literature now, from our, our, for our, our scientific investigation, that lame cows eat less and get thin. We also know from John's work and others that thin cows get lame. 
So we've got a lot of information about the mechanistic background of these, these lesions. Personally, I've had the greatest impact not through impacting the mechanism, but by limiting the damage caused by displacement of the bone, by getting the cow off her feet, by controlling the time budget. That's what we can do right now to help prevent these problems. So as we look at soul ulcers, stall comfort, milking times, and heat stress become the issues that we're going to focus on. This was a, a fourth year University of Bristol vet school study and it shaped my career. They went to two farms in Somerset and solved a lameness problem just by adding straw to the beds. It blew my mind. I was a, I was a, a third year vet student at the time. I went into practice. This was one of the farms I tried it on and it worked every time. It worked like a charm. So there's something about comfort that really improves uh, and reduces the risk for lameness. As we transition from this pasture animal where her time budget is dominated by eight hours of eating and close to 10 hours of rest. If we do that in a free stall, things don't look very good. When we look at the time budget of the free stall cow, we have to take that eating time budget and take those hours and we can do that because we're providing a total mixed ration and put some of them into lying. We have to increase the resting time. We're, we're shooting for 12 hours a day on the farms that I'm dealing with. I'm still, I still believe half the day should be spent lying down in our lactating dairy cows. And if you look at all the other things that cow does, we have to milk her in three hours. We'll get back to that in a moment. Deep, loose bedding confirmed in the literature it's the best for cows. In my world, it's sand. In Finland, it could be peat moss. In Germany, it could be finely chopped straw and lime. In different countries, it can be different things, but it's deep, loose bedding. What does it do? Deep, loose bedding conforms to the cow as she lies down and promotes longer lying bouts. Sand compared to mattresses here, 20 minutes longer lying bout. The lazy boy effect. I could stay down longer. Which means when we're trying to get 12 hours of rest, I don't have to get up as much. I don't have to get up and down as much. If my lying bouts are longer, I can take fewer of them to get to my target resting point. Harder, firmer surfaces, <clears throat> shorter bouts, increased pressure to get up and down. Not a problem if you're a young, fit cow, but it is a problem if you're a lame cow. If you're a lame cow, getting up and down is a major problem, major task. This cow is very lame in her right rear foot. It's extremely difficult for her to rise in that stall. Is it any wonder that it takes a long time and the cow's reluctant to lie back down again? Lame cows don't lie down, they fall down. It's hard to transition. That is the problem that we face with lame cows in confinement house facilities. It's difficult for them to transition between standing and lying. If we provide that deep, loose bedding, we've got cushion, we've got traction, we've got support. So not only do we get longer lying bouts, but we transition between lying and standing more easily. It takes the fear, it takes the risk away for that animal to do that, uh, that task. So we look at all the data on lameness and lying time, and it tells us that lame cows lie down more. Not necessarily. We often have to log transform lying time because it isn't normally distributed. And when we log transform it, we're always going to find longer time statistically. But the truth is, lame cows lie down longer and they lie down shorter than non-lame cows. Here's the data frequency distribution. In the narrow columns, we have non-lame cows. They're normally distributed, centered at around 13 hours of rest. In the wide columns behind, we have the lame cows. They are not normally distributed. We've got tails. On the one side, we've got more lame cows out here lying down for 15 to 18 hours a day, abnormally long resting times. These are cows that are lying down that can't stand up. And over here, we've got lame cows that are standing and can't lie down. And you'll see that more in 3x milking herds as their time budgets are squeezed. 
Neither of these things are normal. Neither of these groups are doing well. Deep loose bedding, I think, promotes normalization of resting behavior. And we've got uh, Karen's work here from Alberta. Biggest study of lying time ever done globally. About 40 herds uh, in each group, 141 farms in total. Sand, close to my 12, close to my 12 hour target. Mattresses, about 10, 10 and a half. Repeatable across multiple studies. We're not getting 12 on mattresses. Somehow waterbeds have contrived to create a product that is worse than concrete. I don't know how they did it. It's the new slogan. Well-designed stalls go beyond the surface. They provide sufficient resting space and we avoid lunging obstructions. And we've got a growing amount of data now to show that that promotes resting time and reduces the risk for lameness as well. But milking time is the other bit that we get into trouble with. As, as we look at trying to preserve 12 hours of rest, it's very hard for our cows to achieve that goal if the time out of the pen milking is more than three hours a day. So 3x milking, we've got to get that cow out of the pen and back within an hour. A little less pressure in 2x milking. That's a problem. We look at this uh, a group of lame cows milk 2x and 3x on a large dairy. We would expect the, the, the 3x cows to produce more milk. Not when they're lame. You actually take them out of the pen. You reduce their ability to rest and recuperate. And in the 2x group, lo and behold, they got less lame through the course of the study. Taking the pressure off, reducing milking frequency in the high-risk population helps their time budget, helps their behavior, gives them that rest and recuperation they need. Heat stress. I used to think I could design a stall where all cows would want to lie in them all the time. And I was wrong. Heat stress has the biggest effect on lying time of any of the other things I've ever dealt with in my career. Within a six day period where the temperature humidity index increased from day to day to day, we saw lying time on this farm decline by four hours. Four hours of rest gone in six days. Not because the cows were changing the number of lying bouts, but that each lying bout was shorter. As the cow lies down, her body temperature increases. She gets to the point where she literally can't stay lying down or she's going to die. She has to stand to do this. This is thermal panting. This is how cows dissipate heat when they're heat stressed. They simply can't do that well when they're lying down. They have to stand and dissipate that heat. Thermal panting saves their lives. These cows in many of our farms are approaching 106 Fahrenheit. Body temperature is very, very high during these heat stress periods. What effect does that have on lameness in our industry? Massive. A massive effect in the late summer. Our increases in sole ulcers and sole hemorrhage are repeatable every year within herd and across herds. Try to book a hoof trimmer in September. They're all busy. They're all busy. This is a, a timeline here. Black is the, the temperature. Temperature humidity index on a single farm. No global warming in the US at the moment. You can see that. <laughs> and this is the claw lesion rate. There's a two-month lag. That's why we've ignored it. Because the heat stress comes in July. The lameness comes in September. Because it creates that delay. Because it takes two months to grow a soul. There's a delay in the lameness. So how do we deal with that? How do we keep cows lying down? They like fast-moving air. Fast-moving air over the resting space is absolutely key in our approach to heat stress management. They love lying in these little zones here. You see these cows? These are at our UW Arlington facility. These are pre-fresh cows. You can see they're all lined up in the, the cone from that 48-inch uh, that fan right there. We've got to be within 20 feet or so, 6 meters, to get that fast moving cooling airspeed. And unfortunately, we've typically spaced fans too far apart to achieve that. And when we move them closer together and angle them to create that, that fast moving air at cow level, lo and behold, the cows lie down. 
and they stay lying down. And we don't see the massive impacts in the late summer that we, uh, we used to see. It, where animals are brought together in a very close confined area, we can bring air down on top of them, not across the top of them, vertically down through positive pressure tubes. These fans are located on the side of the building. They're bringing air in. They're not sucking air out. They're bringing fast-moving air in, and we're piping that down directly on the cows to uh, uh, not cool them, but to help them cool. They're already cooling when they stand up. Physiologically, cows cool when they stand. They're thermal panting. We need to remove that heat and facilitate that cooling. That's what we're trying to do in this area here. We soak in the parlor. We soak in pens. I think as we look to the future, we've got to be much more strategic in our use of water. We've got optic sensors now that make sure that when the cow passes through a soaker station, the water lands on the cow, not on the floor. Some combination of that fast-moving air plus water applied to the cow. Or in some climates where we have low humidity, we can add water to the air and cool the air before it meets the cow. Those are the strategies that we see uh, now and in the future. I think... I see a future where we create a, a hybrid uh, building where cows are allowed outside at strategic points of time where we can naturally ventilate it, maybe with a little help during the winter, but when we really need that fast moving air, we can mechanically ventilate the barn uh, for that risk period. We're going to work on that with computational flow dynamics and three dimensional models and build those, uh, those barns on computers rather than in real life and test the theories and then go out to the industry with those ideas. My final lesion is digital dermatitis, the best till last, because in many production systems, this is the most common problem that we face. And this has really been an issue of, uh, of our confinement housed dairies. And uh, we're going to focus here on hygiene, on foot bath usage, uh, and on treatment, some very boring topics that most of you will say, well, we're doing all right. We're doing that already. It's amazing to, to, to listen to, to folks from New Zealand where uh, we've got this wonderful grazing system that suddenly isn't good enough. Suddenly we put concrete feed pads out to feed the cows a little more concentrate after milking and the cows now become closer to their manure in intimate contact uh, with the manure which we know contains treponemes from the rumen. The risk factors are there, you just have to create the building. And we're starting to see that even in uh, these pastoral systems. We know hygiene is extremely important. And that, that maceration of the skin caused by that constant exposure to moisture is a huge risk factor for this disease. We now know genetics are a big factor. We have bred within our Holstein uh, breed a susceptibility uh, to digital dermatitis. And we're hoping with the recognition of uh, uh, parts of the genome that we can work uh, back out of that uh, problem. We know we can manipulate the quality of the epidermis through uh, trace mineral supplementation to help prevent this disease, particularly uh, in the heifer population. And we know the role of infectious agents. Many infectious agents probably involved in the whole microbiome of this disease, but I, I strongly believe treponemes are central to uh, the creation of these lesions. So we've got a balancing act. Acute lesions, ones that we're very familiar with, always want to have more fun. They want to become chronic. And we're going to stop that with treatment, topical treatment. And you're going to say, well, we always do that, Dr. Cook. And I'm going to say 90% of you aren't doing it properly. Because we have to treat the acute stage cows before they're lame, very early on in these lesion development. We have to actually go look for the lesions, not look for lameness at this stage, look for the lesions as soon as they are occurring, which requires deliberate surveillance, probably in the parlor, sometimes along the feed line, but we're going to have to go and look for them and treat them. And in my world, oops, excuse me. In my world, our topical treatments are uh, <clears throat> still revolve around oxytetracycline. It's still incredibly successful on these early lesions. This is the, the single wrap approach. We're just putting a little bit of uh, two grams of, of tetracycline on the, on the lesion. You, you don't need very much. 
and uh, one wrap around with the vet wrap here show you the technique that wrap falls off the probably the next day or the day after doesn't stay on very long <clears throat> if you see a, a cow that looks like this and the farmer said yes yeah, she just got the lesion yesterday <laughs> you know you've caught them in a lie this is proliferation these are skin cells that don't know what to do anymore these are not hairs this is proliferation of the epidermis this is this is epidermal skill cells gone crazy they don't know what to do and we know the duration of this problem. Proliferation is a bad sign. We know when we start treating heifers over the course of two years, treating them twice a week rather than using a foot bath, we go from about 15 to 25 percent acute lesions, where 45 percent of them have proliferation at the start of the study, to 5 percent or less with no proliferation at the end of the study. Early effective topical treatment. Chronic lesions are not going to respond to two grams of oxytet. What we're going to do with them is use the foot bath to stop them becoming acute again, to stop them having more fun. That's the role of your foot bath. The foot bath may help us with treatment a little bit, but the main role of that foot bath is to stop this transition or at least reduce it. <clears throat> we use formalin, we use copper sulfate, and a myriad of other things in our antibacterial baths. The focus for me is on making sure the stuff gets on the cow's foot. They work much better then. The bath has to be long to ensure sufficient numbers of immersions of the rear feet to get that contact time to improve efficacy. Three to 3.7 meters long. We can hold the bath at 200 liters if we make it narrower. We have a higher step in to short stride the cow. Behaviorally, we know it works. Uh, this is work from David Logue, where the longer bath groups, three herds with a longer bath versus three herds with a shorter bath, the longer bath worked better. It's the highest odds ratio of this study. Karen Orsel is going to present some more data with a longer bath showing improvements in digital dermatitis control. We've now got farms where we don't see acute lesions anymore. We've changed the foot bath program, not using more concentrated solutions, not using them more frequently, using the appropriate things less frequently in a controlled way. We're bathing as infrequently as we can get away with to control the chronic lesion. Starting three days a week and moving from there, increasing or decreasing depending on whether we have control. Watch the acidifiers. They're damaging the skin when they're below pH 3, so be careful. Watch the concentrations. We don't need to be at 10 and 15% copper sulfate to have efficacy. We can be at 2% in many herds. Change it when it's contaminated, 150 to 300 cow passes, and don't forget the dry cows and the heifers. So, Mr. Chairman, I've got a couple of minutes to finish here. Is lameness an inevitable consequence of our higher production, intensively managed dairy industry? Hell no. The cow's at greater risk. I'll absolutely agree with that. But management can rise to the challenge, and it doesn't have to be a problem. We've been able to go back to our industry, who we've been working with for this last 10 years on this problem, and we've asked the questions, what are these guys doing? Where are they at in terms of lameness problems? We saw some of that benchmarking data yesterday from Dan and Nina. This is our uh, ag source database, 200 cows or more, so free stall house dairies. We used a cluster analysis to uh, uh, look at the, the different systems, and we focused on about three quarters of the dairies, the highest producers, uh, well-managed farms, and asked the question, what is the physical well-being of the cattle on these dairies? Averaging over 40 kilos of energy-corrected milk a day. Can we get it done? And I, and I think the answer is yes. The answer is yes. We can see on deep, loose bedded farms within this data set, 11% lameness prevalence. We can see less than 5% hock injuries and severe knee injuries. Not so on mattresses. A third of the cows almost on mattresses getting severe hock injuries. We can't carry on doing that when we know how to solve the problem. And when we look at the management and the housing of these cattle, 
Gee, this looks very familiar. It looks like that literature search that we just did here. 70% of our farms are on deep, loose bedding. 61% are using two-row pens. This is all pertaining to the high-yielding mature cow group. We're using headlocks at the feed bunk. Yes, they're using frequent milking, 3x milking, two-thirds. Yes, they're using BST. <coughs> Terrible BST. 67% of these farms are using it. But we don't use slats, 100% solid floors. Um, we don't use a lot of rubber in these pens, but we use it in the parlors and the holding areas and the transfer lanes when we need to. We're using manual manure systems, manure removal systems. We've got fans over the resting area. We've got soakers in the pens. 9% of these herds, very high producing herds, allow their mature cows outside at strategic times. They've got the white picket fence and we've got cows out on lots by the roadside. So we're trying that on some farms. We've got a lot of trimming, 88% trimming at least once, two-thirds twice in a lactation, half of them trimming heifers before first calving. And we're using foot baths, four and a half milkings per week. That looks extremely familiar. We've implemented what we know. These herds have implemented what we know. And right here is that group right there, not, you know, not representative of all the herds in Wisconsin, representative of the leaders uh, in our state, of farms that are getting the job done. And there's a lot of them. There's a, there's a lot of these farms. And they make a lot of milk in confinement house facilities, high production with lameness under control. Can we do better? I hope so. We're going to keep pushing the envelope. We want to get to 5%. I don't want to see a severely lame cow uh, on our farms. So to finish, lameness is a global problem. We can all take some of the blame, but we also need to do something about it. And we know enough right now to get the job done. If we focus on the three main lesions, and we focus on control, control strategies that include the heifer, the lactating cow, and the dry cow. We need to get into the solutions business. We've got a lot of tools available. We just need to implement what we know. That's life cycle lesion intervention. And with that, I thank you for listening. Great. Thank you very much, Nigel. I'm sure everyone will agree that that was a fantastic start to our, our morning on lameness. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody has got anything they'd particularly like to ask Nigel. So we've got one here to start. We, can we get a microphone, please? Coming up. And could you just say who you are and where you're from, please? Good morning. My name is Alfredo from Mexico. Um, you're talking about air speed. What's your recommendation on this uh, issue without affecting dry matter intake? The, the air speed uh, above the resting area, you're talking about uh, velocity? Air speed. Oh, air speed. Um, what, and how do we implement that with, without affecting uh, no. dry matter intake? Without affecting dry matter, what's your recommendation for the uh, air speed? Um, we, we, it's really about placement and priorities. Uh, we started 15 years ago putting fans over the, the feed bunk because we thought that would promote dry matter intake and so on. Uh, really, the trend has been over the last uh, five to 10 years is to move the fans over the resting space. We absolutely have to get the cow to lie down. Um, those herds I showed you were, were averaging 100 pounds of milk. There's nothing wrong with our dry matter intake. So I think we can move those fans successfully. I think ideally we'd have fast moving air over the bunk as well, but it's about priorities. My priority is where the cow lies down. Thank you. Any further questions? Oh, we'll have time for one more after this one. Uh, Menno Holtzow from the Dutch Animal Health Service. Thank you, Nigel, for your excellent presentation. It was uh, nice to listen to you. Uh, I have just one comment uh, about your uh, slide about the use of the copper sulfate in the food spas. Uh, at the long term, we, we have a problem with that. Yes. And, uh, what's your opinion about the use of the organic acids in the, 
in the food, but it then, seems then to be a relative good yeah, alternative. Absolutely. I, I think globally, again, we're, we're using a lot of copper sulfate, we're using a lot of formalin. Uh, we can still use those products in some countries, not in others. I, I think those are the best products. And as we move away from them, we, we lose a little bit. But I think we can do that when we have a good surveillance program. When you're controlling the acute lesions with identification and treatment, we can use a lot of different products that are much less toxic and easier to manage uh, in, uh, in foot bath programs and still maintain very good control. They may not be as good <coughs> as, uh, as copper and formalin uh, in terms of the, the big picture, but they may be good enough. And there's plenty of evidence to suggest that's the case. And I think that's where a lot of countries, uh, yours, Denmark, and so on, are, are moving because of the controls over those kinds of products. Thank you. One final question. Yes. Uh, Malcolm Finney, United States, Ohio. Uh, turning your cows out on the exercise lots, what time period is beneficial? How long do you have to have them out for benefits? And do you do it also in the wintertime when ground is frozen? So that's where research comes in. Let's fill in the blanks. Uh, my approach is uh, some of the cows, some of the time. When the weather is fair, um, when it's appropriate to do so, uh, open the door. If it's pouring with rain, if it's uh, 100 degree heat, cows aren't going to go out anyway. And uh, I think we can just strategically use it uh, for certain groups of cattle at certain times. Uh, there's, uh, there's plenty of data uh, showing that cows will go outside um, at, uh, during the night. They prefer to do it then. Uh, there's data to say that even when the freestall barn is overstocked, they'll go back in there during the day. They like to do both. They like to pro we need to provide for, uh, for both of those behaviors. And I think a growing number of farms, when we design these facilities, we can build that outside access into the, into the model. But it's some of the cows, some of the time. Great. Thank you. I'm really sorry. We will have to move on. I know Nigel's around uh, today, so, and I'm sure he'll welcome the opportunity uh, for conversations and discussion uh, during the day. Can I ask you to thank Nigel again for a fantastic start? <laughs> <laughs>